Hey everybody, so it's my honor today uh, to introduce the great Jason Morningstar, um, designer of Fiasco, uh, Fiasco 2.0, Night Witches, um, uh, and so many other uh, really amazing games. Um, uh, these are just the first, uh, was it South Carolina Death Crawl, is that the, the name of the game? Um, Carolina Death Crawl, yeah. Carolina Death Crawl, um, that's an amazing one, and Winter, uh, I think it was, is it Winterhorn? Is that the mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Yeah. So Jason is just an amazing game designer. I'm a huge fan of his work. And um, when I think about people who do, you know, really provocative stuff with the role playing games they design, uh, Jason was honestly the first person who came to mind, specifically because um, one of the hallmarks of a lot of Jason's games is that they don't require a game master, that they are games that the group manages to, 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 negotiate and tell the story with themselves. And so when I was thinking about people who'd be good to speak on a week that is all about power and RPGs, Jason came to mind because I think he's really subverting that RPG trope with a lot of his designs that instantiates a sort of like hierarchical structure to the game. So anyways, um, Jason, we're really glad to have you here. Um, please drop some knowledge on us. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, is, is, am I correct in thinking that you assigned Fiasco to your students? Has everybody played it at this point? Yeah, they should have. Okay, so they'll be familiar with that game, uh, which is um, probably my best known and uh, maybe my funnest game. So that's great. Cool. Well, I'm just going to uh, talk. And uh, your professor said, I want you to talk about this general topic, but didn't give me a lot of guardrails. So I, I have some thoughts and opinions that I'm going to share, and they veer off a little bit in different directions. Feel free to um, to interrupt me or ask questions. Uh, is there, Aaron, will you moderate or, or let me know if questions come up? Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll moderate if uh, there's questions. Um, please, if, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll see you on the participant list. And I will um, kindly uh, mention to Jason that uh, if there's a question. That's fantastic. Um, and if that's an awkward format, we can do it a different way. But I'm used to that. And that's OK with me, if it's OK with you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. OK, so uh, uh, I'm Jason Morningstar. I'm the creative director at Bully Pulpit Games. And I design analog uh, tabletop and live action games. Uh, I'm also an experienced designer. Uh, that, with work in both playful and educational settings. Uh, I, my first game that I published was in 2005, uh, but I've been making games my whole life. I think the first game that I ever made was in first grade and it was uh, 100 row and 100 column tic-tac-toe. It's not a success, but I learned a lot. Uh, do the math on that, you'll see that that is not a game that will work. Um, but uh, as was mentioned, I make a lot of games that uh, interrogate power structures. Uh, and often that's deliberate. I think it's uh, also just a part of how I express myself. Uh, but uh, usually there's, there's some focused uh, interrogation happening in my games. So uh, I'm interested in how people interact in the real world. And if you've played Fiasco, you'll see that one of the things that I'm doing there is uh, exploring power structures related to things like asymmetry among player roles or uh, the social contract, or even the tyranny of having to sit around a table together. Uh, but I'm also interested in character level power structures, right? That give you sort of alibi for uh, exploring different ways of being or ways of thinking. So for things like race and class or war and its uh, impacts, um, the shitty outcomes of all wars, authoritarianism and dissent come up in a lot of my games. Um, the carceral state, uh, things that are in conversation with the real world, often abstracted. And I'm going to talk a little bit about abstraction uh, in a moment, because that's always the decision that I have to make if I'm dealing with something that is uh, topical or historic, whether I'm going to treat that uh, as ground truth or whether I'm going to abstract it, for example, into fantasy. Uh, and uh, I've done both, and the choice is very individual, uh, and I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk about that stuff, and as well as some core principles I think are really important, uh, and I'm going to mostly use my games as examples, but not entirely. So the first thing I want to talk about is something that uh, 
I think it's super important. And you, you may be discussing this in, in your exploration of games, but if not, you should be thinking about it. And that is apophenia. Apophenia. I wrote it on a card for you. Uh, and the definition of apophenia is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. And that should be setting off all kinds of interesting alarm bells for you because it's a central tool in uh, game design, right? So this is, uh, apophenia was coined in the 50s by a German psychiatrist named Klaus Conrad. Uh, and he was really interested in looking at delusional thought. Uh, and you can see like the meaningful connections between unrelated things. It sounds like something that uh, you see in uh, paranoid schizophrenia, for example. Well, you can also use it as a tool very consciously and deliberately. And as a side note, I think there's a super interesting conversation to be had about the connection between delusional thought and creativity. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that. We're just here for the creativity side of it. And um, to do that, I'm going to uh, demonstrate using one of my, or not one of my games, but a game I really love by uh, a guy named Stuart Candy, who is a futurist. Uh, that's, that's his job. Uh, and uh, he made, he and some friends made a game called The Thing from the Future, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with. But uh, The Thing from the Future is a set of cards that allow you to play a bunch of games for forecasting the future. So uh, I'm going to demonstrate apophenia by using the thing from the future. So I grabbed four random cards from the deck uh, up from the thing from the future. And what we have uh, to work with are, and I want you to be thinking of these, uh, as I say them, in the context of creating an object. We're going to create a, an object from the future. So we have activism. That's part of this object. We have candy, also part of this object. We have pride, and we know that this is a positive development in the next seven years. <clears throat> so in the next seven years, something good is gonna come out of the combination of activism, candy, and pride. And I'm betting, I'm willing to bet that you're already thinking about what this object might be. Uh, you might have some idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't understand that. I, I think that was uh, someone accidentally unmuting that. Oh, great. OK, great. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you're thinking about a particular object, that's apophenia at work, because those things really don't have anything to do with each other. But um, uh, it's easy to uh, match those things together, come up with uh, uh, a way. Your, your brain's going to match those patterns to create something coherent. And when this happens, uh, it, it, uh, consciously, uh, then, you know, it's, it's work. When it happens unconsciously, it's like magic. And you see this uh, happen in, for example, long form improvisation. Uh, you see it happen in role playing. Uh, and it's always kind of spooky. Like, where did that come from? How did the game know that that was going to, going to emerge? Did, did it read my mind? That's crazy. Well, it's apophenia. It's, it's, uh, it's that pattern matching that's happening. And I use it all the time. Uh, when I'm making games, I'm always leaning on that, sometimes really hard on that. So uh, an another example uh, from uh, one of my games, uh, there's, I have a game where you are, uh, uh, you're uh, creating a, a situation and within that situation, characters are gonna be speaking in the first person. Uh, and the situation's laid out, what they say is laid out for you, it's prescribed. But what isn't is who, who says what. So for example, we've got, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're shipwrecked on the coast of Alaska in 1888 and we're all starving to death. Things are real bad. Uh, the characters we have to work with are Anne Nickerson, her father, who's the captain of the ship, Captain Nickerson, and the, the uh, deckhand Kenneth here. So these three people are, uh, that's who we've got to work with, Anne, her dad, and the deckhand. And this is what the card says. And remember, we don't know who's, who's saying this. One of those three is saying this. It is with the last of my strength that I make the effort to cut a throat with a cod knife. It is not an act of malice, but one of love. So, you know, things are pretty dark and uh, uh, there's a, a murder that's happening, but it's a murder from compassion. And... <laughs> Uh, I see somebody said RIP deckhand. Awesome. You clearly envision the captain or 
his daughter ending the the deckhand's life uh great uh and maybe that maybe that uh, compassion and love comes from having extra meat for the family to eat i, I don't know uh, i could also see a situation where any other of those combination of characters are the principal actors there the daughter maybe she's ending her father's suffering right there's all kinds of ways you could look at this um and uh what's happening there is that your brain is taking these disparate pieces of information and creating a backstory for these characters. You're plugging it in. Yeah, sure. Uh, by the time this happens in the game, uh, you will have created a backstory for these characters. And it may be that uh, you know that Ann Nickerson is slowly dying from an injury and that it would be an act of mercy for her father to end her life. Uh, you'll have all this information, but uh, the example I'm giving here is that you didn't have any information. There's no obvious choice, but uh, a narrative asserts itself because of the way our brains work. Uh, and uh, that's apophenia, and I just love it. I think it's great. The other thing that's it's nice about it is it's liberating because I don't get to decide. Uh, I don't have to facilitate that interaction. Uh, someone's native genius is coming to the fore, and I think that's beautiful. There are lots of ways to do this, and you see it in a variety of role-playing games. There's a technique called fishing that's pretty well established. And if I'm, if as a game master, I'm fishing, uh, I can say something like, you see someone walking out of the mist toward you, and they're carrying their own head under their arm. Uh, it's somebody that you know. Who is it? Well, uh, the chances are very good that in the context of the game, you're going to put things together and realize who that must be. Right, because there's going to be a really good answer uh, based on both the collective experience we've had and patterns that you're putting together based on the inputs that the game has given you. Uh, that's called fishing, uh, and it's a very, uh, very easy technique to incorporate in any game, and it can also be systematized. Um, anytime you present a couple of pieces of information and just accept that they're connected and important, wonderful things will happen. If you played Fiasco like you were supposed to. The setup in Fiasco does that. That's all it does, right? Uh, it's, it's saying like, uh, uh, you and I uh, are uh, lovers, but it's on the down low. And also I'm in debt in my business. Well, all of a sudden I'm starting to get a feel for who this character that I'm playing is, even though it's just a very few pieces of information. There's not a lot of contextual framework, but it all comes together in such a way that um, usually you have to stop people from co-creating once the setup is in place. Um, in my experience, you often have to say, uh, okay, hold on, we don't need to, to figure everything out. Let's have some surprises as well. Uh, because you've got, you know, uh, really about eight tiny bits of information that create a very, very rich story that's poised for disaster. One final example of that. Um, you can do this with creating characters. An example of that from the game we talked about briefly, Carolina Deathcrawl. Um, but, uh, in Carolina Deathcrawl, characters are just a pair of cards. So uh, let's see, I don't know if we can see that or not. I don't have my own view. Yeah, you're good, okay. So here's a character in Carolina Deathcrawl. This is Corporal Isaac Eager. Uh, he is an intellectual and a criminal. Whoa, all right, what's that about? Well, we don't know, I guess we're gonna find out. But it could just as easily be Isaac Maybank, because there's a whole bunch of cards to choose from. And Maybank, now he's an intellectual and an aristocrat. Either way, uh, whatever your character turns out to be, it's two cards with a very few pieces of information. Uh, and immediately uh, a personality starts asserting itself. Some points of contact, uh, the character becomes pretty easy to play. Oh, wow, I'm a criminal? What kind of criminal? Uh, I'm an aristocrat? Interesting. Why am I in the army, right? You, you start asking uh, these questions, putting these disparate pieces of information together. And the fact that those two cards are essentially random, you know, any combination is going to work, uh, tells you that your brain is actually doing the effort. Jason, you have a question. I do. Yeah, um, Aaron. Um, I was a little curious. Um, it kind of just occurred to me because when um, I played with a group of four people and we all played really collaboratively in the sense of like, no one was trying to screw anyone over. We we're all like, we want to make this narrative like collectively. But it's like now I'm recognizing, especially with the mechanic later on with like the positive outcome cards and the negative outcome cards where you can like give them to other players. I'm real, I'm like realizing that can be like a bad thing, like an action that's like supposed to be like, I'm trying to screw you. Was that like 
so when you made the game were you trying to make it more collaborative or combative against like each other sort of game or like all of the above Aaron that's a great question and it's a it's a really interesting design point because fiasco is uh ostensibly it's a competitive game in that there are different outcomes for different characters somebody might end up uh in the aftermath doing very well and someone doing very poorly so on the one hand you have that piece of it and on the other hand the game very explicitly tells you that you want to work together to create a very fun narrative uh, that sort of emulates the tropes of neo-noir fiction. Dumb people are gonna get in trouble. Uh, there are gonna be powerful impulse con control issues, uh, ambition, uh, and uh, the joy of the game is watching people make bad mistakes, making, watching characters make bad mistakes. So I've played Fiasco. Uh, actually, I played it with a, a pretty famous game designer who said, your game is broken and I'll prove it to you. And I was like, great, let's, let's play and see. And, and uh, this uh, individual played uh, in, in a way that where he, he, uh, he chose to resolve all of his scenes and he chose to have them all be positive. So at the end of the game, his character had a wonderful outcome uh, and nothing bad ever happened to him. But what actually happened in play is that the other three people at the table kind of routed around him. Nothing interesting happened to his character because we knew that uh, you know, he was gonna decide that things went well. It wasn't interesting or fun. And so there was a, a conflict between the game's intention and the, the fact that the game trusts you to play it the way it's intended. And th this guy sort of leveraging the mechanics to do to prove a point, I guess. So he, did, he didn't have fun for two hours and the rest of us had a great time anyway, which uh, t told me that the game was fine, uh, you know, that it, that it worked quite well and was not broken uh, when played as, as uh, intended. But yes, there's a tension there. Uh, and um, I think that your use case isn't a big deal because there's a limited uh, possibility space with positive and negative outcomes. So if you're playing where you're very supportive and you want everyone to do well, halfway through the game, you're gonna run out of cards. And then the rest of the game, everything is gonna be negative. All the outcomes are gonna have to be bad. And if you're playing by the rules, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to figure out why that is. Um, so I think that that becomes a very weird lopsided narrative of good stuff than bad stuff. And the game's really meant to have the little good and bad um, in between, but that's not playing wrong. It's just playing different. I hope that answers your question. It absolutely does. Thank you cool. so much. Good, good, good. All right. And we have one more question from okay. Derek. Hello. Um, so I was just listening to you talking about like uh, the game design aspect of your game. Um, and when I was uh, writing about like my thoughts about the game as a whole, I put in that as like a new kind of like role playing person, um, something as big as Dungeons and Dragons, or at least the way that it was kind of introduced to me was that all I had was kind of like classes and like races to kind of build myself off of. And everything after that was a little bit of like my own imagination, right? Um, and I kind of saw fiascos like having sort of like limitations of like to what to choose from in terms of like relationship and like who you are and all that stuff. I actually kind of saw that as like a positive um, because um, I felt like I was starting to get exhausted of making everything myself, you know what I meant or what I mean? So um, I wanted to ask you, like, is there a reason why um, you came up with the idea of like having those limitations? Like you were talking about how when you were answering Aaron's question that like eventually you're going to run out of uh, positive outcomes. You can't keep making up positive outcomes. So eventually you're going to have to start dipping into those negative outcomes. Is there a reason like design wise, like you decided to limit the game more than what it feels like other role playing games like to do? Yeah, there's a thank you for that question, Darius. There's a, some really good reasons there. And this uh, fiasco came out of a tradition of, of similar uh, games that, that uh, did other uh, things uh, that um, I, I built on. So there's a game by Vincent Baker called In a Wicked Age, where there are evocative lists of details that you're choosing from. And when I saw that, it's, I was like, oh, well, evocative lists of details. That's a really wonderful way to build a situation. Um, when I made Fiasco, I, I had a very specific use case in mind. And what I had found was that I often would be meeting, a gathering with friends, often at game conventions, and I wanted to play a game with them, but we only had a couple of hours. Uh, and most of the role-playing games at that time either assumed that you were gonna play literally forever, like Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons, or they would take about four hours to play. 
and I didn't have four hours. So I said, I'm going to make a game that you can play in two hours or maybe three hours on the outside. That was, uh, and every decision I made, if it didn't meet that, I threw that choice away. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I wanted to make a game that was very accessible, that dealt with a topic that people could instantly jump into. Uh, and so uh, the idea of like, uh, powerful ambition and poor impulse control, playing to fail, flipping the script on uh, most role-playing games, which are sort of heroic power fantasies, uh, and then modeling film a little bit, all seemed like really good choices uh, to, to, to reach those goals. And that's, that's how it came to be the way, way it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting because like, this is my first class or not first class, but this is my first experience with like role-playing games like this class is. Mm -hmm. uh, everything beforehand would always be just be like, you know, traditional video games. So it's really uh, interesting seeing how just like even role-playing games is a lot of variety in the approach of like making them. Oh yeah, there's so much. And that's a whole different conversation. I hope you're getting lots of exposure over this semester. I know you talked to Alex Roberts recently and her game Starcross is a beautiful example of a game that is uh, very, very uh, well-designed and very, very different from most games. Uh, so there's there's lots of variety, and I think that's wonderful. Okay, uh, I welcome these questions. Keep them coming. Uh, but uh, in the absence of any right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so uh, this is related to pattern matching a little bit, and and it's a topic that is important in I think in my work, uh, and that's manipulation. Uh, there there. Uh, people who say that game design is mind control and that you're trying to make people feel something. Uh, and some of that I think is true. Um, games can teach, obviously. Uh, they can encourage empathy. Uh, I think that's also obvious, although I think some people might argue about that. Um, I think it's because of this sort of pattern matching, which gives us ownership over the co-creation that we're doing. Um, and the things that we're making and keeping are our own. Uh, and that's important. Uh, but you can, you can build things that make people feel things. Uh, and I think that's both powerful uh, and kind of a, an awesome responsibility. So a couple of examples from my own work, I made a game that's about hating fascists, uh, that's about uh, burning with incandescent rage at Nazis. Uh, it's called Gray Ranks, and it's set during the Warsaw Rising of 1944. Um, I have a copy here. This is the Polish version. It has a cooler cover, so. Um, uh, but uh, it's uh, you play uh, teenagers during the Warsaw Uprising, uh, and the way the game is set up, it's 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 anchored in in real history, and real history means that the Warsaw Uprising is going to fail, uh, and you're probably either not going to survive or you're going to end up in a concentration camp. Uh, that's that's the the uh, framework of the game, and within that, you're telling a story of resistance. You're telling a story maybe of love. Uh, and while the, the city around you and the things that you hold dear are systematically destroyed. Uh, so as you can imagine, it's pretty intense, uh, but it's, uh, it's also very beautiful. And I structured it in a way that allows you to, to sort of approach the, that, that uh, thematic content in a thoughtful and safe way, uh, but it doesn't pull any punches at all. Uh, and uh, the, the, the thing about it that I think works really well is that the game, the, the game is relentless about showing you that the Nazis are going to win. There's just, you, you're going to lose, they're going to win. Uh, and that is, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. All you can do are make choices uh, during the game that are essentially heightening the catastrophe for uh, your, your character's lives. Um, and, uh, you know, you can fight back and do good, but the, the cost is crushing. Um, and my hope is that uh, it demonstrates um, if nothing else, uh, the fact that uh, fascists, fascists are assholes uh, and destroy everything they touch and that you need to resist them even at enormous cost because the people who really lived through the things that that game is about did uh, and uh, I have a profound respect for them. And also it's living history. Those, some of those people are still alive and I was very conscious of that as I made the game. And we can talk more about history in just a minute. Another question. Yeah, so um, we'll go Adriana, uh, not Adriana, Aaron, Adriana, then Daniel. That was the key. Um, so when we talked with uh, Alex Roberts about Starcraft, we, oh my God, love that game. It was so much fun. It's a good um, game. Some, it was, oh my God, it's fantastic. But, uh, oh God, um, 
I don't need a fan about that right now. The um, one of the most interesting things I think she said just in general, and you're really touching on a lot, is that um, like it's not really like winning it's more of like just experiencing the game even Mm -hmm. if you fail even if like your characters die like fully Mm -hmm. it's still like that's like a big part of playing so in terms of like your game making process do you make more games where I mean to quote her she kind of was just like it's more fun when things go south do you like enjoy implementing that more in your games because of that I do Thank you, Aaron. I really do. I am not interested in power fantasy. I'm not interested in cool people doing cool stuff. I think that there's a place for that. And if that's your thing, I mean, great. If you love that kind of play, it's liberating and fun. But I just, I I get so much more out of people trying really hard and just not quite making it. Or people who just have bad ideas uh, and get in trouble. And many, many games I have are either... Um, uh, commenting on uh, commenting on power fantasy in in a in a not quite serious way, or they're about people who are really trying but maybe aren't going to succeed. Uh, not always, and there are many counterexamples. But uh, I think failure is way more interesting than success. Failure opens so many other opportunities. Success closes opportunities. You won. Congratulations. You did the thing. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think that's really interesting because like. Especially with, we read like a couple of articles for this class in this week um, and our subject, uh, those are like power and like games in this vein. And a lot of the time it's supposed to be like, you draw like kind of pride from intellect, right? So it's interesting to see so many like tabletop role play games that kind of divert that expectation because it's the opposite. Like you're drawing power, not like necessarily not from intellect, but like you're trying to experience instead of win, which I think is so much fun, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I'm on that experiencing instead of winning. Um, Aaron and I are actually working on a game that I was thinking about while you're talking about night witches and I'm just going to be selfish and ask if you could talk a little bit more about night witches, your design process, um, or like what play testing was like, we're doing something similar, but more about racism and it's a whole thing, but I'd love to, to hear how that was for, for you in that, that creation process. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it, it's a little farther down my outline and I will jump ahead to it and I would love to see your game. So uh, please, if, uh, if it reaches a point where you feel comfortable sharing it, uh, I would love to see it uh, and uh, give you any feedback that you felt you, you in whatever context, if you, if you just want to share it, if you want me to give you a critique or suggestions, whatever, I'm always happy to hear about make, people making games about serious topics. So yeah, awesome. So you, you asked about Night Witches, which is a, a game that I wrote um, that is about the 588th Night Bomber Regiment, which was a group of pilots during the Second World War who uh, were given outdated biplanes and uh, tasked with harassing uh, Germans on the Eastern Front. So the Red Army Air Force uh, told them to bomb uh, the German front lines and they would fly 12 missions a night, uh, dropping 100 kilo bombs. When they ran out of bombs, they would drop railroad ties. Absolute heroes, um, an amazing story of resistance uh, and triumph. And the thing that uh, is really compelling about it is that the entire regiment uh, from their commander down to the mechanics and uh, pilots and navigators were all women. Uh, The Red Army Air Force didn't like them. They didn't want them. uh, And they gave them the worst equipment and the worst missions. uh, And they they kicked ass. Uh, So that's what the game is about. It's about the intersection of total war. So come to bomb the Nazis. Uh, and endemic sexism uh, within the within the Red Army uh, because uh, you're being discriminated against. Um, and there's a whole thread of, as you can imagine, there's uh, gay romance happening in there, um, all kinds of things uh, in the context of these women who are being pushed way beyond the breaking point. So that's the, um, that's the story of the game. Uh, and when you play it, uh, the idea is that you follow these women from their training all the way to the liberation of Berlin. Uh, the entire war uh, is laid out and you experience the things that they did. Uh, this is another game rooted in history, but that's really, uh, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a war story, although it is, uh, it takes place during a war, but it's, uh, um, it's kind of a story about 
feminine trauma, I guess, in some ways. Uh, so uh, you can take it in whatever direction you want as a, as a group, but uh, all those elements are in play and none of them can be avoided. So I came upon this story a long time ago and uh, was really captivated by it. I did a lot of research. Um, uh, I read the literature at the time that was available about this group uh, in English. And uh, I wrote a game uh, and it was just terrible. It was an awful game. It didn't play well, it wasn't any fun. Uh, and I put it in a drawer uh, thinking, I just don't have the tools to do this. And then a few years later, I played uh, uh, Vincent and McGay Baker's uh, game, Apocalypse World. And I, a light went off and I realized that they had created the technology that I needed to make Night Witches work. So Night Witches was uh, inspired by and, and informed by and uses the core technology of uh, Apocalypse World to make the game that I needed to make. Um, and so that's sort of the, the origin story uh, of that. Is that helpful? Does that answer your question, Adriana? Yeah, I was just wondering if I, if I can ask a second question, sure. um, how, you, how you balance with just such a heavy topic, how you kind of weighed wanting the player to feel all of these serious and traumatic elements, but also still have an overall enjoyable experience. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that that applies to a lot of my work. Uh, and uh, happily, I, I guess happily, I, I wish more people would play my games, but it's also kind of a filter, right? Because um, I don't really have to design for somebody who is not gonna be receptive to the message of that game or the content of that game. I don't have to like, play tricks to get somebody to play Night Witches. They're going to either be into it or they're not. And if they're not, there are a million games for them to play. I think uh, games like Dungeons and Dragons do have to think about literally everybody. Uh, and I have the luxury and misfortune of not having that problem. So um, there's a built-in filter. Uh, you, when you say, yeah, we play uh, bomber pilots who are bombing the Nazis, everybody's in. And then you say, and we're all women and everything sucks. And then a lot of people will fade and good, right? Because I don't wanna play with them. I don't want them playing my game if, if they're just not uh, going to engage with the material in an honest way. And beyond that, I just trust the people who make it through that filter to wanna to do it right as best they can. Uh, and I give you the tools to do that, I hope. Uh, and those tools are things like um, uh, the game structure, uh, the, the way that the game approaches uh, some of the, the difficult topics in it, uh, and the, the uh, advice for facilitation that are, that's built into the game as well. All of which I think gives you guardrails for addressing those things. And none of which is going to prevent it from being too heavy or too much, but you just have to trust and love the people you play with. And I try to start from that assumption. Uh, anybody can ruin any game. And if you want to break it and make it not fun, well, you know, I can't stop you but I'm not gonna design for you. Got it, thank you. You're, yeah, you're welcome. Okay, there's another question. Oh, um, so I was actually going to ask about um, the apophenia and also like the concept that you have to like mind control your players somewhat and like how it applies to the way that, um, for like Fiasco, the way that you designed the play sets because, um, I was wondering how you like decide what elements to add to your play sets, because, um, for example, what if you have something that uh, the players don't actually recognize and so they can't make connections because they don't know exactly like what it is that is on the card, for example. And so, um, for example, I noticed in the game that there are a lot of specific references, but there's also a lot of um, things that are a lot more like general and a lot more um, understandable, even for people who potentially have never been in that. Um, context or have never interacted with like that sort of field before so like the the specific like models of vehicles or something but you can generally understand that it's like a type of vehicle uh, or other things like that so I was wondering like how do you decide what should be in a place and what is like too inaccessible to have that's a great question thanks uh I I, uh, it's actually kind of hard because you want to balance a general and specific for the reasons you, you described. Um, you want to make sure that there's something, at least a few things that someone will be able to latch on to. And uh, also things that are murderously specific are really funny. 
uh, quite often. So um, sometimes it's best to be like, it's a bulldozer, but sometimes it's best to be like, it's a D9 R6000 bulldozer with the clove hitch attachment or whatever, uh, which maybe will give somebody inspiration or give them a chance to have their character exercise some expertise by repeating that language. So a little of both, I, I think is very important uh, it, that you, you, you wanna uh, be welcoming. There's, there's a lot of subtlety to playset design. Uh, you also wanna be careful about relationships to make sure that any relationship will work with any other relationship. Um, that can get really complicated. Uh, for example, uh, there's a play set that's uh, set in high school and originally it had both teachers and students and that just doesn't work. It had to be all students or all teachers because there were like romantic relationships and there were uh, collegial relationships that just didn't make any sense or were like, you know, not, not cool at all when, when, they, when they were mixed. So, so you have to think about uh, that as well. Uh, relationships can be binary or they can be a dyad that is reflecting off a third party that you're making up. There's, there's a lot of complexity to it. Um, and you, you, you identified the key points there. Uh, you want to make sure that it's accessible, but also has some, some good specificity to it, that every element is interesting and worth using. Uh, I often see people with a playset that will have a, a category like objects, weapons, a gun, a club, a baseball bat, an ax, a different gun. Those are all the same thing and nobody cares. If you're gonna have a category that's weapons, one of them should be a live snake. And one of them should be, you know, a hundred pounds of TNT. And one of, you know, like anybody can make up a gun, who cares? Nobody cares about a gun. Uh, so those are, those. Are, you got me on a rant about fiasco uh, uh, play sets and I could talk about that for a long time. You're in the clear to start rolling again. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, we had uh, we had started to talk a little bit about history, um, and I just want to say that uh, mo most of my games are informed by history, even games that don't seem like they would be, because I think history is great. Uh, everything's been done. If you make a game that's not in history, people will assume it is because they'll find the thing that echoes the thing that you thought you made up. Um, there are lessons in our past we really need to be teaching and learning right now. Um, there's so much to steal. Uh, I just don't understand why people don't make more historically inflected games. I've made a ton of them. I got a whole a series of live action role playing games that are about the history of Southwest Asia. So I've got a game about the second uh, Lebanese Civil War, got a game about the Sykes Pico Agreement that divided the Middle East after World War One, got a game about Syrian refugees, and all of these are uh, abstracted. All of them are set in space. Uh, Middle East, uh, for reasons I'll get into in a minute. Um, I have a game called Space Post that I really love, and I wish more people would play, that's set in, uh, you know, in some random lonely outer space thing, uh, and you play a, a letter carrier that's delivering mail to these outposts in space, uh, and your partner is an intelligent spaceship, and the two of you go from place to place delivering mail in the most remote outposts of the galaxy. That's what the game's about. That's it. It's a feel-good game, uh, and uh, on the surface, you think, well, that doesn't have anything to do with history. Well, I was inspired by the Postal Service's Rural Free Delivery Initiative, which began in 1891 to deliver mail to every address in the United States, which was a huge ambitious project that saw lonely mailmen delivering mail to weird places. Um, and that got me thinking, and the result was Space Post. So uh, tons, tons of games that are uh, defined by history in some way or another. And, and I just think it's, uh, it's a good playground for, for people to work in, for sure. Um, uh, and I could talk about that more, I suppose, but we'll, we'll get back to it. Space Post. Yes, it's on itch uh, at the Bully Pulpit Games uh, itch page. Uh, and it's a lovely game. I think, I happen to think it's a lovely game. So something that I uh, talk about that's getting toward abstraction, which I've been promising to talk about, is the idea of fidelity versus friction. I talk about, I think about this a lot. Um, uh, when you're designing something, either a game or an experience, there's, uh, there's an axis, right? On, on one side, there's fidelity. How close to truth is it? How close to reality is it? And then the other direction, there's friction. How difficult is it to implement? So uh, I, I consult in uh, medical education sometimes, and often you'll see things like uh, surgical simulators. 
And a surgical simulator needs to have very high fidelity. It's got to be as close to realistic as you can make it. Uh, but that also often means that it's, there's a lot of friction. And that friction comes in the form of money, time, uh, expertise in building a computer simulation, for example. Uh, so high fidelity, high friction. Um, and uh, often when I, when I approach those settings, that's what they expect. So uh, if I come in to design a, a, a student nursing orientation, they'll be like, well, you know, we, it, I'm not sure how you're gonna do this with a computer, right? Uh, how, how, how will the students uh, do their orientation uh, and how will it be like a video game? Because you make games, so obviously you make video games. And the answer there, you know, is low fidelity because it doesn't matter if it's a one-to-one -one representation of reality necessarily, and low friction because we can use index cards and Sharpies and make a, a treasure hunt that's gonna teach them what they need to know about working in the children's ward, for example. So uh, that's, worth, that's worth thinking about because, uh, for example, when I made Night Witches, it's a game that you're meant to have fun playing it. I don't want it to be agony, uh, even though the subject matter is harrowing. Uh, I want you to have fun with it. So uh, the game has to be uh, accessible to you. It has to be interesting and exciting. There have to be moments of genuine enjoyment, but at the same time, I don't want to lose the reality of it because it's important to me. I want to honor ground truth. Some of those women are still alive. Uh, as I was making the game, I, in my mind the whole time was I could meet these women, right? They're in their 90s in some cases, uh, but I could meet them. And I want to be able to, to be proud of my work. I want them to look at it and be like, yeah, this is, this is a, a worthwhile reflection on our experience. With Grey Ranks, in fact, which is about the Warsaw Uprising, the Warsaw Uprising Museum in Warsaw uh, vetted the game and gave it a thumbs up. They were a little confused, but they, uh, they thought that it was very appropriate and supported it and stocked it for a while. Uh, so so uh, you can think about those two things. In Night Witches, there were a lot of times when I changed something in the interest of playability. Uh, for example, uh, there's just weird trivia, like the name of the airplanes they flew changed in the middle of the war. And so I could have said in the game, oh, by the way, if it's 1943, those planes are called U-2s now instead of PO-2s. But it, it's a, that's just cognitive dissonance. It's, it's, a, it's a load on the player that's unnecessary. So it's not as realistic because you fly a PO-2 throughout the game. Who cares? Um, if you care, probably the wrong game for you. I'm moving the dial there to reduce friction and at the same time reducing uh, uh, fidelity just a little bit. Another really good example of this is a game called Dog Eat Dog. Uh, and Dog Eat Dog is a game explicitly about uh, colonialism in the Pacific. But the really interesting thing about, well, there's many interesting things. It's one of my favorite games. But one thing that's cool about it is that it's not explicitly tethered to any real history. So you can play it knowing really nothing about the history, the social and political history of Oceania, uh, but you're still gonna have a great time. It's gonna be profoundly moving, probably a little disturbing, <clears throat> disturbing and uh, you're going to create a group of islanders and co colonists uh, who are completely made up at your table in that moment, but that have the same interests and problems and needs uh, that, that the people uh, in Tonga or Tuvalu actually have and had. Uh, which I think is brilliant. Um, so there's a, a, another place where the, the dial is being adjusted. Uh, it, it wouldn't be as good a game if we were telling the story of the, the colonization of Hawaii. Uh, it's much better that it's very amorphous in that case. It was a very considered decision and I think a very successful one. So uh, I've been teasing you about abstraction and the, the, the thing there's like, the question is, do I abstract this topic or do I honor ground truth, right? Do I tell the story of the night witches or do I tell the story of the space night witches? It's a very important thing to think about. Um, and re reflexively, uh, the answer people often have is, well, obviously space night witches, right? Because if I can tell that story using Star Wars, more people are gonna engage with it and they'll have a better time. A and to an extent that's true. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are people who will play Night Witches and just change everything to Star Wars. And that's a choice you can make. Uh, it makes me a little sad because really what I want to do with the game is 
show you something, make you feel something about real people who did a real thing. Uh, in that case, the choice I made was not to abstract it. And so when people do, it, it kind of bums me out a little bit, uh, but that's fine. Uh, let me give you a counter example of a game where I, I absolutely did abstract it. I have a game called Winterhorn and uh, Winterhorn is a, it's a live action role-playing game uh, about uh, a group of government agents who are destroying an activist group. So it's kind of a teaching game because uh, it starts out as kind of a cool spy thriller. Uh, uh, and your professor has played this game and can talk about it uh, more. Uh, but uh, so you're there, you're, your job is to degrade and destroy this anti-government group that seems like they might be kind of dangerous. Uh, and as you play the game, you're choosing the methods that you're gonna use. Are you gonna do, um, uh, are you gonna do a disinformation campaign? Are you gonna put an agent provocateur into them? Are you gonna do a black bag job to steal their records? Uh, are you going to use violence against them? Uh, and at the end of the game, uh, chances are pretty good that you have disabled or degraded uh, this, this group of activists. And it's teaching you about um, uh, the, the sort of methods of, uh, of governments everywhere. So I didn't really want to make it about the FBI or set it in East Germany and make it the Stasi. What I really wanted to do was universalize it. Um, the, the game, it's critiquing systems of oppression, but it also allows you to inhabit them. Uh, and I knew that if I really focused it down and said, well, you're FBI agents, it's COINTELPRO, it's the 60s, people would be saying things like, well, do, do, can, do we have the right kind of telephones? Uh, how are we dressed? If it's 1965, are we all, and like, irrelevant, don't care, not what I want you to be thinking about. What I want you to be thinking about are these systems of oppression that you are embodying and how you're destroying people. Uh, so uh, that's a game that I abstracted. Uh, another game that I abstracted, this is a, I think this is a good example because um, I didn't really intend to do this, but, but it worked out great. I have a game called Ghost Court. And in Ghost Court, um, it's a game about uh, ghosts and living people going to Ghost Court because they have problems and they're suing each other or, having some kind of legal dispute uh, and it's a party game. It's very light, very silly. Uh, uh, and someone plays a judge and you have these uh, little uh, mock court proceedings that last about five minutes per case. Someone came up to me after uh, Ghost Court was released and said, wow, you've got a game about two groups of people that are treated very differently by society. And they have complex rules that bound their separate behavior and they're coming into conflict. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Wow, uh, that's kind of like, this is a game that uh, kind of touches on race and class in a really interesting way without that being the intention. It was meant to be just cotton candy ridiculous, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I couldn't escape uh, making that commentary. And if you sort of bring it to the surface, it adds a real level of sort of uh, trenchant uh, commentary to the game. So you could call that an abstraction as well. I didn't abstract Carolina Death Crawl, which I showed you earlier. That game is rooted in real history. I did a lot of research for it. Um, the actual events that you, you portray could have happened, whether they did or not, probably not. But um, it's, it's set in real history and it's meant uh, uh, to, uh, to teach you something about a particular moment in American history. I see we have a question. Hi again. So, uh, yeah. Um, right. Can you get, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was thinking again about like just designing games in general. And when you're talking or about going into ghost court, you're talking about, you know, abstraction, a lot of things. And, um, it seems very useful for, uh, getting people to only focus on like things that are relevant instead of, um giving them unnecessary things to know you know yes absolutely do you think role-playing games um it's like that's the only medium where like you can kind of do that and get uh and get away with it because i feel like at least with my experience with like video games um anytime where an abstraction is done um that lowers the realism or um or just in general just kind of just put something to a side to make uh, or that ruins how accurate it is in history. I feel like the game gets kind of like criticized for that, but mm -hmm. 
but it seems like the way that role-playing games or at least the games that you've been talking about it kind of feels like it's something that like should be doing do you think role-playing has that role-playing games kind of have like um um like they have the ability to do that and like is there something different about role-playing games and like video games that allows yeah. abstraction to be like um kind of more useful than it is like being like a cr critique of it yeah it's it's hard for me to say i, I don't uh, on the surface i don't think i agree with that i think there are um there are video games that do abstraction well uh and there are uh tabletop role-playing games that do it poorly and you know in both cases they're praised or called to account for that so i, I i'm not sure I, I don't know i think about um a game like papers please uh which is uh you know that's there's have it's heavily abstracted but it's a really serious topic you know it's a game about immigration and it's a game about authoritarianism uh, and i think it does it very well so uh um that's that's an, an example a, a counter example to what you're saying and i could name tabletop role-playing games that choose to abstract something that really probably isn't appropriate but wow uh, okay i see a, there's a written question here which i'm going to read and then reply to uh, in the context of your distinction between abstraction and non-abstraction, I can see thinking of historicals, uh, historicals specify specificity being another type of abstraction of the present problems or concerns. Interested in your thoughts on this in regard to games made with specifics about current issues, such as some serious games. Uh, great. Uh, let me talk about my game, Terps. Um, Terps is a game about combat interpreters in Afghanistan. I wrote it because uh, I was uh, dismayed at the way that they were being treated, regardless of your feelings about the war in Afghanistan, we were essentially abandoning these people who had risked their lives for, for our, our own troops, I guess, um, and our own objectives. Uh, and so I wrote a game called Terps, and in it you play combat interpreters. Uh, and it's, it's just an explicitly political game. It's a game that right on the right on the label is like, I want you to get mad about this. I want you to write to your Congress people and get these people visas to get them out of Afghanistan. Uh, I wrote it in 2016, I think, uh, well before things fell apart. And uh, uh, I thought a lot about it. Um, I thought about how how or why this would be abst abstracted or not. It's current events is happening in the moment, right? Uh, and uh, so one, on one level, I, I thought, well, this should probably be a game that's very realistic about these actual people. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I needed to abstract it, both to provide some aesthetic distance for people to engage with it, and also uh, for uh, players' comfort with the game, uh, that people would probably feel very uh, uneasy about portraying a Pashto speaking Afghan citizen working for the American military, that that's just a, that's a lot to ask somebody to, to portray that role. And by setting it in space Afghanistan, a lot of those issues uh, are removed and I can still uh, make the same political point, which is that we should be giving visas to those people and getting them and their families out of the country. So, uh, so that's an example uh, of a like a super of the moment a game that was abstracted because it was it made the most sense for the game. I wanted people to engage with it, and I felt that if I made it uh, absolutely uh, like a journalism game, that nobody would touch it. And I think it was the right choice. Contra that, you know, I've got games that are set in history that I didn't abstract because the history is uh, too important. So, thanks for that question. A uh, question from Emily, any of the history related games you've created, have you had many opportunities to meet and talk with those people to gain insight? Yes, uh, in some cases I have. With Terps, I have, I've played it with uh, uh, American uh, veterans who've worked with combat interpreters. Uh, I vetted the game with um, uh, an intelligence officer who uh, managed teams of combat interpreters. Uh, I haven't shown it to actually any combat interpreters themselves, uh, but I was sort of close to the source material there. Uh, the Warsaw Rising Museum vetted gray ranks. Um, I have no connections with any of the people in uh, Night Witches. Um, uh, I've got connections with people who hate Night Witches. Russian nationalists don't like Night Witches. We were threatened about publishing it in uh, Russian, uh, but we did it anyway. Uh, that's a different story. Uh, so, uh, so yes, a little bit, uh, probably not enough. 
um, but enough for me to feel that I'm, I'm at least being thoughtful about the material and not being offensive or crossing lines just because of my own ignorance. Uh, another really good game uh, about, uh, or that is just explicitly political is a game called The Tribunal. Uh, the Tribunal is by a guy named Yitomas Harvinen, uh, and he wrote it for the LARP Writers Summer School in Belarus. Uh, and if you don't know, Belarus is, um, it's a full-on dictatorship, uh, and open dissent doesn't go well in Belarus. Uh, happily, though, you can make silly, harmless art LARPs uh, in Belarus, particularly if you're a foreigner. Uh, and so uh, Yitomas Harvinen uh, wrote a LARP called The Tribunal, which is, um, uh, it's a game about the mechanisms of oppression. Uh, and in it, it's a live action role playing game where you play soldiers who have been uh, uh, accused of uh, a crime they didn't commit. And unless they rat somebody out, they're going to get executed. So it really uh, uh, takes uh, sort of the fiction of people like Orwell and Buchner and uh, makes it very, very visceral for the participants. And when it was first uh, uh, when it was first played, it was, uh, you know, it, it, the message was not lost on the Belarusian audience uh, or participants. So explicitly political uh, and a really compelling and fun game to play. You, you all could play it uh, and I encourage you to. It's a great game. All these games I'm mentioning, I'm happy to provide links to after the, uh, after the talk as well. All right. More questions. I'm open to more questions at this point. I can talk more, but uh, these questions have been so good. I really appreciate them. All right. While you're uh, thinking about it, I'm going to talk just a little bit about something that uh, your professor mentioned uh, at the beginning of the, the, the talk, which is the idea of interrogating the power dynamic at your table, right? So. Um, I think about this as authority versus credibility. So in most games, there's a very reflective organization of power. Uh, there's a game master who's in charge of everything except what your character says and does. I think that's a shitty dynamic most of the time. And if you're making games, I think you should think very hard about that. Like what's the best arrangement of uh, authority and credibility at the table? Who gets to create stuff? Who gets to co-create things together? Who is in charge of agency, both character agency and maybe even player agency in some cases? And who has the credibility to make those choices rather than the authority to make those choices? And that's a distinction I first heard from another game designer, Vincent Baker, who I've mentioned before, uh, because authority is great. I, I, if I can tell you this happens uh, and you agree, well, then that happens. But if I don't have any cred credibility, then it doesn't happen. So a, a great example of this from my own life is as a game master one time, I thought it'd be really cool if one of the characters got river blindness. What a tragic arc for their character to, to slowly be going blind from an incurable disease. So I said, hey, buddy, uh, guess what? Your character has river blindness. And my friend and the player looked back at me and said, no, he doesn't. Nope, doesn't happen. And at that moment, all my uh, authority went away and so did my credibility because uh, he just said, no, our collective fiction doesn't include that. What are you gonna do about it? Your choices here are, uh, I quit the game or you take it back. I don't want that to happen. And it's, it's a fascinating uh, moment when uh, it really laid bare this distinction, right? Uh, if we had workshopped that together and he had agreed, then it would have been fine. If that was something that he thought was super cool and I suggested it, that would be fine. But ultimately I had no authority and I love that. I think that's so interesting. Look at Fiasco, you've played it, you're, you're supposed to have played it. Um, it doesn't say anywhere in the game who gets to say what and when, and that's very deliberate. Uh, nobody gets to say that stuff or, or nobody gets to be told that stuff because I trust you to know better than me uh, who gets to say what and when. It's not relevant to me as a game designer, how you organize yourselves socially. I trust that you can do a good job with that better than I could. Um, similarly, if you look at Starcrossed, uh, Starcross has a beautiful asymmetry to it. There's a lead and a follow. And there, there are two roles that are very different um, 
responsibilities. They're both equally important. Uh, and uh, what you see there is uh, um, there is no there is authority because the lead does certain things and the follow does certain things. Uh, but that that has to also be credible because both parties have to accept it as truth uh, and and value their uh, partner's contribution to uh, the the beautiful uh, story that they're creating together. So that's me ranting a little bit about authority and credibility, which I. I, again, I can't stress enough. It's a great place to start when you're making a role-playing game. Like who, who gets to decide what and what's the best organization? And if you make a game with a game master and a bunch of players, that's a really good time to, to stop and think if that's the best structure. And it might be. Uh, I've made certainly made games with that structure, but it might not be. Or maybe that's a structure that functions well, but that you want to rotate. So like in Night Witches, there's a facilitator and a bunch of players but every time you make a substantial change in location in the game, you change those roles. Uh, and that works really well because uh, once you've uh, moved in Night Witches to a new location, things should be different. Uh, your priorities should be different. Uh, the way things happen in the, in the sort of causal space of the universe should be different. Uh, so that, that was a good uh, choice in that case for me. Um, Jason, I have a question for you while-, while oh, Sure, yeah. Uh, percolating. Um, I, I think specifically because of Fiasco 1 and Fiasco 2, and I think this could be asked of any artist, but you're also a developer and a creative director, right? Like, so this is a hat you have to wear. How do you know when a game is done? Like, what is that that line for you that is the, the game is done line? Yeah, it, it's a, that's a great question and a really interesting one because I have the luxury of deciding that. I think uh, many people who work in a commercial uh, setting like if you work for wizards of the coast they're going to tell you when it's done it's going to be done the 15th of february you know and that's that's how it is um and and the products i think often reflect that so i do uh, as someone who owns my own company with one partner like we're we're a tiny company making tiny games for a tiny audience i get to decide and the the way that i do that I guess it varies, but um, I want to make sure that my game absolutely works, first of all, right? So there's a there's a whole play testing regimen, and I take it very seriously. Uh, internal testing, external testing, the game's got to work. Uh, and if I'm confident that it works, then it, then it becomes a sort of a production timeline. But those things are not often in sequence. So um, uh, I feel confident that uh, a game is ready to move on to the next step when I've done my due diligence with it personally. Uh, and I've seen the game function very well multiple times without me being in the mix at all with the target audience, basically. Uh, so I'm pretty methodical about that. I try to make sure that I get lots of people to try it, lots of people to uh, um, uh, push on it and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, and sometimes, actually pretty often, uh, games will just go back in the drawer or get torn up for parts just because it works for me. Uh, if I'm running the game for my close friends, it's just amazing and it's super great. But then when I put it on a table with strangers, it's a disaster. And that's that's not good enough. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pursue that until something changes for me. That's what happened with Night Witches. I wrote it in 2007. It, it played okay uh, at my table, but other people were like, this is nonsense. It's no good. I don't understand it. And then I, I, but I knew the idea was really good. So instead of abandoning it completely, I just sort of tucked it away for a while, which I often do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a perfect answer to my question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we've got about 15 more minutes for questions, folks. So um, I think uh, questions would be really appreciated. If you're trying to scratch the creative itch, figure out what your question is. I would just think about the design of Fiasco and some questions that uh, come up or have come up when you're playing the game. Um, but right now we do have a question. So Gabriel. So uh, you mentioning how Night Witches went away for a little while reminded me of a little bit of confusion I had earlier. When you talked about, um, you said the technology wasn't there to do that game yet. And then another game came out with 
um, like that allowed you to do it well? What do you what do you mean by that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. What I mean is that um, I uh, the 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 game mechanics, the the systems that I put in place to try to create the experience that I wanted, just didn't work. Uh, my, my own native genius hadn't come up with something that was going to work, uh, and I wasn't happy with it. And when I saw Apocalypse World, I saw in Apocalypse World the things that I needed to make my game work. And that's really how uh, all game design works. Nobody's creating in a vacuum. Games are commenting on other games or inspired by other games. They steal from other games. So um, th there are there are through lines and traditions within game design, just like any other sort of artistic medium where people are riffing off each other, they're commenting on each other, they're, they're having a critique of somebody else's uh, uh, ideas about how things should be done. And when I, when I played Apocalypse World, um, the, the core mechanic was simple. Uh, it was direct. It allowed you to create emotional moments in a way that was important to me. And I just was immediately like, oh yeah, I get it. I need to pull that out of the drawer. And it was only a matter of a few weeks before I had a functioning version of Night Witches that I could uh, show to people uh, that was inspired by Apocalypse World. And then of course I asked Vincent Baker if he was cool with that. And very graciously, he and McGay were cool with that. So uh, they let me use their technology there. Uh, and ultimately it's a very different game. It's my own game uh, it, and uh, it's not really a hack of Apocalypse World. It's pretty, pretty, uh, it stands on its own, I think, and does a lot of unique things. Good question. Matthew? Um, what you just said actually reminded me a lot about um, what uh, Alex stated about uh, Starcrossed. Literally, she said pretty much the same exact thing, how her game was inspired by, um, I can't remember what it's called, this horror Jenga Dread. game. Dread, inspired by Dread, yeah, Dread. yes. Yeah, and how she even like got in contact with them, made sure it was okay that she could use the mechanics and everything. And it kind of connects back to what you were saying at the beginning, how with history, everything's already there. It's all there. There's so many things to steal. And that probably goes, seems to, that seems to apply to also the um, just history of games and everything that's been made in games. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're using steel in a kind of facetious sense here, right? We're being inspired by other people. And when it's, when it's pretty close to something that someone else has used, of course, you want to uh, make sure that they, you have their blessing. But in many cases, uh, that inspiration is sort of just in the air as well. I also wanted to ask about um, kind of like the power dynamics in your game and how you decide how to set that up. Like one thing I noticed that was interesting more than anything else, it seemed like the power dynamics you created in your games is more the players versus the game itself or the story itself. Like um, in Night Witches, it seems like it's the players against the history and, and same goes for um, the, the Warsaw uh, uh, Revolution game that you uh, discussed. Mm -hmm the game mechanics and the story itself is what the players are against. So it seems like the game has more power than the player. Is that an intentional feature in most of your games to have the, the story itself have more power? And does the game mechanics reflect that? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I think that uh, creating a fairly rigid historical framework is, is an effective way both of conveying that history uh, and bounding the narrative, right? So in Night Witches, the possibility space is very constrained. You're definitely gonna be playing someone who presents as a woman. You're definitely gonna be playing a, a pilot or a navigator. Uh, you're definitely gonna be in the Second World War in the Red Army, right? It's just like, those are the, those are the boundaries. Um, and you're gonna play out the history of the war and you're not gonna assassinate Hitler. Um, and same with Grey Ranks. I think that that, that those kind of constraints can breed creativity. If I know that all that is in place, I don't have to think too hard about the things that uh, the game designer doesn't care about. Uh, and I think that's very valuable. Not all my games do that. I think Fiasco kind of inverts that because you're creating your own situation and then you're uh, gradually uh, 
interrogating and expanding on that situation. So in that case, the boundaries are the initial setup. I'm giving you creative prompts to work with, but once you've chosen those prompts, uh, it's out of my hands and literally anything can happen. And I'm happy with that as well. Thank you. Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. All right, Erin and then Yoon. Um, just in general, because it sounds like you've made a lot of games like as a whole. Um, how do you kind of like do you have like a streamlined process or is it just very abstract or like just like like you go with like what comes to you at the moment or that's a great question. Uh yeah, that's it's um in a difficult one because I think there are things that I I lean on, but every game is a little bit different. Um, one thing that uh, I find that I'll do is sort of iter iteratively design either in a text document or on paper, um, just sort of running through scenarios or, or math if, if it's a game that has some numbers associated with it. I was doing that today, in fact. Uh, I, I was uh, sitting in a parking garage, uh, furiously trying to figure out, I'm trying to capture the experience of flight and thinking like, how, how am I going to do that in a way that's that hits all these notes, but at the same time is anyway, yes, every every project is a little bit different. Something that I find that I do that's very helpful to me personally is to um, not really design in layout, which is a very bad habit, but to lay, lay things out um, so that I get a feel for what objects or text will look like on a page. Or if it's a card-based game, I'll mock up some cards, uh, which I find helps me be creative. For example, um, if I'm making a game that uses uh, uh, playing cards or the playing card format, like uh, uh, Desperation, this game that I talked about a little bit earlier, um, seeing the words on the card is very helpful because there's a very finite limit to the number of words you can put on a card. Uh, and so knowing when I'm sort of in the right uh, space helps me define that text. Um, sometimes laying out like a character sheet is very useful to me. Uh, but um, so I find myself doing those kinds of things. But otherwise, it's basically having a, a Google Doc or a text file open and hammering away at different ideas. That, that seems to be the, the closest thing to a unified approach that I would have. I do not have a, a very formal method. And I know that my collaborators and uh, business partners wish that I did. Uh, one last question um in terms of like writer's block or like ever like losing inspiration is there something that you can specifically do or like how do you kind of deal with that as a game creator yeah that's a that's a really good question and the, my answer to that is to be doing six things at once so i've got uh many many more than six projects going at the same time in various stages where we're poised to start a kickstarter tons of work to do related to that um, I've got games that are early, early in the process that are just bare ideas. I've got games that I need to refine the layout on. I've got games that um, are uh, pretty well defined, but, to, but need some love. Uh, and if one thing is just running into roadblocks, I'll go to another one. Uh, also, my business partner sometimes says, you need to do this right now. You need to fix this, or you need to create something for this. And then I just do what he says. I'm gonna I'm gonna butt in because I think this is kind of the flip side of Aaron's question. How do you deal with burnout then? I've n I don't what what are you talking about? I, I love my job. This is what I do for a living. I, I have loved it since I was a child. I've never gotten tired of it. Now I get tired of games, of specific games. When when Night Witches was was almost done, when it was 95% done, I hated it. It was a millstone around my neck. I never wanted to see it again. I never wanted to play it again, which is, a, I think, a common uh, feature of any kind of extended creative effort. Um, you, you hear authors talk about that as well, of just loathing their book uh, when it's in the last editing stages. Um, so, so that's happened to me. But I've never just been like, I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted. I'm uh, mentally, spiritually spent. I need to spend a week uh, in Tonga. Never happened for me. And uh, I feel very fortunate uh, that that's the case. Um, but what do you do when you're sick of it and you still have 5% left? Oh, that's different from being burned out. That's just, uh, for me anyway, that's just raw venomous hatred of the material because it's been uh, front and center for so long. Uh, I've worked so hard at it. I guess maybe it, it, that's burnout too. That's fair. Uh, I, I, it, it's only 5%. It's so close, I just push through. 
and that's when I rely on my uh, my friends and partners to support me as well. So so in that case, uh, it's often down to a punch list of items. Uh, you know, th there needs to be an explanatory paragraph about this. You need to write the text for the sell sheet that we send to retailers for this. We need a new graphic for this. Um, it, it's not strong. It's not a, a creative work usually at that point. I love the creative part of it. Uh, you know, early in the process when things are all sunshine and rainbows and I can do whatever I want. It's when other people start imposing their uh, their requirements on me that it gets it gets old. I hope that's helpful. Your experience will differ. I, I think that's pretty unique. Um, Yoon and then Tim, I, you'll be the last question. All right, hi. I was really interested in how you talked about all the different games you made and how it applied to social commentary at the time, um, especially games like Dog Eat Dog and Herbs. And I was wondering, um, with the how, with how much you vary between fidelity and fr um, friction between games, um, what's your thought process in either prioritizing more on the fun gameplay experience or more on creating more accurate depictions in the history and more on the message more than just the fun experience? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a point at which um, you're not really creating a, a, a game for entertainment anymore. And there's a place for that, right? There's a game for simulation or a place for simulation and for uh, essentially a, an exercise, either in a classroom setting or um, uh, an, a specifically an empathy exercise for groups that need to understand an issue better. Uh, and I do some of that, uh, but but uh, my most of the time, what I really want to do is make uh, a game or an experience that is uh, approachable and accessible to a wider audience who can genuinely enjoy playing it and get that 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 content, um, or uh, play it and then be told uh, have the opportunity to explore it further. So, like my game about the Second Lebanese Civil War. When, when we're done playing that game, it's a LARP. And when we're done LARPing and we debrief about it, I, I talk about that and say, well, you know what? This is a game about the second Lebanese civil war. If you're interested in it, here's some resources. Uh, and if you're not, that's cool. That you just had a, a dynamic experience. Um, so in that case, I'm just sort of planting a seed. And sometimes that's the, the right approach. I don't know if there's a, a way to systematize that. Uh, I, I, it varies from project to project and I often struggle with it. Uh, and usually it's playtest feedback that will that will hone that one way or the other. Sometimes I'll playtest something and people will be like, this was way too heavy. Um, I don't want to live that experience. Uh, and that tells me it's either not a game for fun, but a game for teaching and learning, or that it needs some kind of aesthetic distance or maybe some abstraction. So playtest feedback often helps with that. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And last but not least, if you have another moment, uh, Jason is to I do. Yeah, so um, I, I, I sort of come from a background where I used to take a lot of uh, improv courses. And uh, we did like, I remember like a lot of long form improv stuff and Fiasco, which by the way, I, I really enjoyed playing. Thank um, you. Uh, it reminded me a lot of, of that. And so I guess I'm just wondering like how much, how much were you inspired sort of by that? Yeah, that's, a, that's awesome. I, uh, I've done a lot of improv myself. Uh, certainly when I was writing Fiasco, I was on a, 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 a team. Uh, we did a bat heralds all the time uh, and uh, had a great time with that. So I was well aware of uh, sort of the, the group mind things that were happening there uh, and uh, the, this sort of pattern matching that I've been talking about. Uh, I saw it there first, really. I, mean, I probably saw it in role-playing games first, but I saw it powerfully used in a very methodical way in long-form improv. So yeah, it's absolutely built in there. And something that's been very gratifying to me is seeing uh, improv groups take fiasco and uh, recontextualize it back into performance, which a lot of groups have done. There have been fiasco uh, shows all over the country, which is amazing. Yeah, Thanks, that's, that's, really, that's really cool. And then one last super quick question. How did you come up with the name Bully Pulpit Games? Because I really like that name. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't, eh, uh, this was in 2005. Uh, it, it's, uh, we were like, well, let's, uh, let's uh, sort of model our company after the ethos of Theodore Roosevelt. 
uh, I don't know why. And he always often talked about having a bully pulpit. So we we're like, okay, it's uh, we're going to have a bully pulpit as well. We're going to tell people uh, what we what we have to say uh, from the bully pulpit, and that's how the game or the the uh, company got named. All right, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Jason. Let's all give you one last big round of applause. Ooh, thank you. This is so fun. I uh, I feel like I kind of ranted a little bit. I hope this was useful to everybody. I, I think it was wonderful, um, a really insightful be, behind the curtains look, mm -hmm. um, but also um, a, a great exploration of power. I loved how you touched on um, how you design these games and all these different ways that you articulate different visions and versions of power, relationship to power in your games. So um, it was excellent. That, awesome. with, with that said, I'm going to turn off the recording though. So I'm going to okay. uh, wait. One last question. Um, if students want to contact you, is there a place that they should uh, reach out? Yeah, uh, probably. So informally, uh, I'm uh, at J M S T A R on Twitter. You can always say hey there. Um, otherwise, it's through the company. So bullypublicgames.com. I'm Jason at bullypublicgames.com. And I would welcome you to contact me. Uh, if you're making games, get in touch. Uh, I would love to, to uh, at least give you a high five. Uh, we're, we don't really publish other people's games, so don't send me a pitch, but I would love to see what you're working on. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, and I'm quite sincere about that. All right. Um, all right. That I'm now officially.